And with that, we do dismiss the kids to Kids Zone. The nursery is now open. If you would have a little one and you want to partake of that, it's staffed as well. Such a joy to see the kids go out. You know, every week, every single week, here at Kingston Alliance Church, someone walks through our front doors for the first time. I, since I've been here, I have not yet had one Sunday where I did not meet one new person. There's always someone new here. And praise the Lord, they're almost always met by someone who understands that all of us are on the hospitality team when it comes to welcoming others. And someone finds that they come in and they're greeted with a smile and a warm handshake, a cheerful disposition and a keen interest in who they are because God made them in His image. Praise the Lord. And I'm ever grateful for those who practice the ministry of welcoming. Not just because it's a needed ministry to welcome all who come in, whether they're newcomers or longtime adherents or members alike, but, but because making a good first impression counts. It makes a difference. I remember walking into an Alliance church for the first time in my life, late March of 1985, and as I looked around the church, because I didn't know really where I was, I didn't know where the sanctuary was, and I'm looking around, and someone saw me, a couple who knew that that was part of their call to welcome newcomers. They saw me looking around and they saw the confusion on my face because I didn't know where to go. And they said, you must be new. And they extended to me their hand in greeting. And Albert and Sarah Grusetti welcomed me to Stony Creek Alliance. They're still my friends to this very day. They came up to me. They greeted me. They wanted to make sure that everybody who came to Stony Creek Alliance Church felt welcome. And so they, they, they had that and they understood that as part of their ministry. And they answered all my questions about the church. They stood and talked to me for some time. They found out who I was and what I was doing. And they, they spoke very positively about what Christ was doing through that church. They answered all my questions. They even asked if I would sit with them so I would have a friend in the sanctuary. And I testify to you today that it is partly because of their ministry of welcoming that I am who I am, so deeply involved in the Alliance to this day. Because my walk with Jesus Christ started off there with that welcome in that place. First impressions matter. They matter. They matter because they're lasting impressions. And it's true, you will forget what you say to someone when you first meet them, and they will forget what you said to them when you first meet them. Exactly what Albert and Sarah said. I don't remember the words that they used or the phrase they used, but I do remember, and you will remember in your first impression, if someone makes you feel welcome. You remember how they make you feel. And if they make you feel welcome, if they make you feel heard, if they make you feel important, if they make you feel special, you remember that. You remember that for a very long time. Perhaps even the rest of your life. And the opposite is true too. If you walk into a place and you feel unwelcome and someone makes you feel unheard as though you're not important, well, you remember that also. And you inevitably respond accordingly. How you are treated, what that first impression gives to you and how, you make you, how that makes you feel either gives you a warm feeling when you think about returning and so you feel warm and you feel, like, yeah, I want to go back there or it's a barrier to returning. And when you think of returning, you're repelled by that idea. And so you respond accordingly. So it's so important to make a good first impression. And as we continue digging in today to Luke chapter 10, we find that Jesus wants us to make a good first impression. Because He is great. His name is great. His kingdom is great. And to that end, His Word gives us both instruction and capacity to know that how to make a godly first impression for His kingdom and in His name. And you will walk away from this message knowing exactly how to do that. Praise the Lord. But before we open our Bibles, let us turn to Him one more time in prayer. And Father, now we open Your Word. Up until now, we've been singing Your praise. Up until now, we've been considering what You're doing. 
up until now we've been experiencing your presence with us, but now, Lord, we open your word and we open our ears and we say, Lord, now speak to us. As you've been speaking through us all through, speak to us now again, Lord, through your written word. Let these words jump off the, tech, the, the pages of the Bibles that we have. Father, let them land in our hearts. Change us, Lord God, so that we might be more like Jesus Christ as we leave this place today. We give you glory. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles then to the Gospel of Luke. We've been spending the last uh, number of weeks here looking at the work that Jesus appoints us to. The work of reaching others that He has all of His disciples doing. Reaching others with the good news of the Gospel of Christ. And we we, we, we found a lot here just as we've begun looking at Luke chapter 10. Let's recap what we saw here. In the first two verses, verse 1 and verse 2, we saw that the work starts in prayer. It starts with us praying for more workers. Jesus says, pray for more workers. And as we pray, the Lord uses us in His work right out of the box. He answers our prayers. That's for sure. But He also opens our eyes to how we can be at least a partial answer to our prayers at the same time. Because as we pray for others, we realize that God has some for us to reach also. He has some for us to reach also. And friend, you and I are not going to reach everybody in Kingston. We can try, but we're not even going to be able to say hi to everybody in Kingston. There's too many people. And even to this whole church, we're not going to reach everybody in Kingston. But praise the Lord, we can reach some. We can reach some. In fact, God has some for us to reach. And I want you to know that. God has some for you to reach. You are the key to the kingdom of God for someone else. I want you to know that. You're the key to His kingdom for someone else. They may hear the gospel a thousand times through the radio and the television and newsprints and flyers and pamphlets and all sorts of different ways, but when you speak to them, it's as though they hear it for the first time. As though they hear it for the first time and they're like, I didn't know that. And they finally realize that Jesus Christ is willing and more than able to wash away all of their guilt and all of their shame, to wash away all of their sin, and that a relationship with God Most High is not only possible, but a present reality through Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Therefore, Jesus tells us to start by praying for more workers. The work starts in prayer. More, prayer more for our sake than for His sake. But the work starts in prayer. And that's just the opening two verses. Then we, we, the work continues as we looked at Luke 10, verses 3 and 4, and that we have to count the cost. We who are His disciples, who He sends into the world, we have to count. We have to be prepared to lose ourselves for His sake. We looked at that last Sunday, that in sending us, Jesus warns us that we're going to face some opposition, some spiritual opposition, significant opposition. He says, go, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. There is always going to be spiritual opposition to what God wants to accomplish. And when we go in His name, we're going to experience some of that opposition. We experienced some of that even yesterday. And we came to this church and saw all these people coming to this church for that purpose. And there was opposite, there was minor things, but there was nevertheless some spiritual opposition. Praise the Lord, God makes us able to overcome. In fact, we're bound to overcome the opposition. The only reason God even allows the opposition is so that His enemies might be humiliated in opposing His will. Even in the act of going, we, when we set aside our priorities for His work, God's enemies are humiliated. They weren't even able to keep a, a weak human being from engaging in the work. Glory to God. And as we practice faith, as we exercise trust in Christ, we find God providing all that we have need of. We find Him overcoming opposition. And as we keep our eyes on Him who sends us, we gain courage, we gain conviction, we gain confidence to honor Him who is more than worthy of the work that He sends us to. That He has appointed to us. Glory to God. And that's the second message. We looked at it last week. If you missed those messages, they are online. You can take either the message or the whole service. They're both on YouTube. 
for you to revisit. And today, as we continue in Luke 10, we find that having prayed and having counted the cost, we get to actually encountering other people. This is the point where the work goes beyond ourselves, where we meet someone else, and the work goes beyond us. And Jesus says that when we first meet them, we are to begin with blessing. We are to begin with blessing. Look at your Bibles, Luke chapter 10, verse 5. He says, when... You enter a house. And just stop there for a moment because already there's three more things to notice about the way Jesus wants us to do the work. When you enter a house, he says, friends, that means that Jesus sends us out, there's immediately an opportunity. When Jesus sends us out, there's immediately an opportunity, an opportunity by divine command, by divine providence, and by divine timing. You can know that. You can know that when you go out to do the work, there's divine command, divine providence, and divine timing. Because Jesus sends us, there's a divine command. He says, go, I am sending you. We're not being sent out by some angel. We're not being sent out by some minister. I'm not sending you out as your pastor. God sends you out. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, sends you out. He says, I am sending you. It's a divine command. And because Jesus sends us, there's divine providence too. There's somewhere to go. God has somewhere for you to go. A place of another. Someone else's place. A place that Jesus has for us to go in His name. And because Jesus sends us there by divine providence, He also has divine timing. When we get there, we find an open door. He doesn't say, go, I'm sending you out. If you find a house, if someone welcomes you in. No, he says, when you find a house, enter. When you find, not if. And friends, that tells us something. It tells us that Jesus has gone ahead of us in this work. It's not that he's he's sending you out saying, I wonder what's going to happen to them. I don't know. I'm not going to go. I'm just going to stay here. But you guys go out because that's just scary. Jesus doesn't do that. He goes ahead of you. He prepares the way for you. You cannot be engaged in the work of Jesus Christ and not realize that God Himself has prepared the work for you. In fact, Ephesians 2.10 comes to mind. It says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which, say it if you know it, which God prepared in advance for us to do. There it is. Black and white text right in the Scripture. Friends, surely one of the greatest blessings of doing the work of Jesus is knowing that He made us for this purpose. He made you to be engaged in what He's doing. He didn't just make you to know Him. He made you to be part of what He's doing right here, right now in our day. Praise the Lord. Why then be hesitant? Why be fearful? Why hold back? God has commissioned us. God has prepared the way for us. God goes with us. God has supernaturally intended all of these things. What a blessed work. What a wonderful work. We get to partner in what the Holy Spirit is doing right now in our community. Glory to God. There is no more a fulfilling role in all the world than going to do the work that Jesus has for us participating in what the Holy Spirit is already doing. Doing what Jesus prepared for us to do. And the friends, that doesn't mean, and I want us to understand, it doesn't mean that everyone you meet is prepared for the good news. It doesn't mean that. And some people need to know this. Jesus doesn't tell us that every door you knock on will be opened. He doesn't say that. In fact, you may spend many days praying and looking for an open door, but he does tell us that when we intentionally go in obedience to his command, we will find an open door. We will have an opportunity. You will find an open door. You will have an opportunity. God did not mean for us to be silent witnesses. He did not mean for us to be silent witnesses. We will find an opportunity because God is deeply involved in this work with His people, with us. Divine command, divine providence, divine timing. And so when we find the open door, friend, we know we have an invitation. An invitation to enter the space of another in His name. 
in His name. To bring them something of God, something of Him. Therefore, because we recognize that we are going in His name, because this open door is there in His name, for His name and for His glory, we know that we can engage in this. We can participate. We can, we can accept the invitation to, to step into the space of another. And when we do that, we do it with care and respect. Because we're not going in our name, we're going in His name. We're stepping into the other's home, and therefore we are in their place. We're on their turf, as it were. And so we go, and we go with respect. We go with grace, lest the opportunity be wasted. 1 Peter 3.15 comes to mind. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this, Scripture says, with gentleness and respect. With gentleness and respect. I was reading a quote the other day that said, we can't go and share the good news and not be good news. And some have opened the door and Christ followers have come in and not been good news at all. No, we've got to do this with gentleness and we've got to respect. We're on their ground. We're on their turf. And I cannot really overemphasize this point. Friend, have you ever had someone come to your house, come inside your room, come inside your space, perhaps you've invited them in, and, and, and they almost immediately disrespect you in some capacity? Has that ever happened to you? I remember one, a long time ago, there was a vacuum cleaner salesman came to my door. I, had, I was living in an apartment in Stony Creek, and this guy knocked on the door, and I opened the door. He goes, yeah, I, I want to talk to you about the, the, the product that I have here. And I would like to just have just five minutes of your time. Can I have five minutes of your time? And I said, oh, five minutes, why never? Sure, come on in. And he came in, he opened up a can of dirt and sprinkled it all over the carpet. And I thought, what is that? What is, and I get it, I get it. He just wants to demonstrate the effectiveness of his vacuum cleaner. I understand that. But they've disrespected their host right out of the box. Therefore, they've lost before they even begin. Because that offense is not so easily dismissed from mind. It's like, a, it's like walking into a place and someone says, why are you here? Oh, you're going to remember that. They didn't make you feel welcome. And when you, get dis when you disrespect the other, when you're not gracious and not kind, people remember how you made them feel. So act and speak with gentleness and respect. And all the more so because we're not trying to sell a Kirby vacuum cleaner. Jesus doesn't say, go out and impress them with your vacuum cleaner. He's, he, the King of Kings sends us to them out of His great love for them. Therefore, we go out of His love for them and we want to express something of His love for them. We're not representing a product or a service. We're representing His glorious name. And hear me then, friend. The open door is not an opportunity then to impress them with us or to impress them with our product. Okay? We're not sent to push a program. We're not sent to push a denomination. We're sent and the Lord providentially opens this door for us that we might have an invitation to bless another with something of Him. With something of God. Look at verse 5 again. It says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Notice that word, first. First say, peace to to this house. This is of primary importance. Begin with blessing. Begin with blessing. You know what the first thing that Jesus said, the risen Christ said to his disciples? Remember when Jesus, uh, they were all gathered behind the locked door for fear of the Jews, and Jesus came and stood in their midst. Did, what did he say to them? Did he chastise them for being fearful? Did he say, what is this with this locked door? What's wrong with you people? Did he say that? No. He said, peace be to you. He didn't scold them. He didn't berate them. He didn't begin with an explanation of covenant theology or an Old Testament overview because they clearly didn't have their, their thinking straight. No, he didn't do any of that. He began, at John 20 says, on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together and the door was locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Verse 19. John 20. 
Verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And Thomas wasn't with them. When Thomas was with them, the word of God says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were again locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Three times the risen Lord Jesus Christ appeared to his disciples, and three th times the first thing he says is peace to you. That's more than a greeting. That's much more than a greeting. Remember, they were in fear. They were in fear of, 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 of persecution. They were very concerned. Their Lord had just been crucified. What's going to happen to them? If, if that happened to Him, what's going to happen to them? And so they're in fear. And Jesus says, peace to you. That's more than a greeting. Matthew Henry said that it's true that shalom or peace to you is a common form of salutation, but at the same time recall that Jesus said, greet no one along the way, but to those in whose house they enter, they are to say peace to you with seriousness and reality, because this is much more than a compliment. Mr. Henry noted that Christ's ministers go into all the world to propose peace to all, to preach the peace of Christ for all, to proclaim the Prince of Peace to all, the Gospel of Peace to all, the Covenant of Peace to all, peace on earth to all, just as we pray for peace. And so we start with the blessing of peace. We start with the blessing of peace. Friend, that is so appropriate. It's so fitting because the first sign of the kingdom of God is peace. The first sign of the kingdom of God is peace. With God, there is peace. The reason we're looking forward to the coming kingdom of God is because there will be peace on the earth. Praise the Lord. With God, there is peace. There's overwhelmingly rich, abundant, serene peace, calmness, tranquility, sweet peace. The language Jesus uses here is the Greek word irene. It means a state of peace that is a blessing or favor from God. From God. Not from us. We don't say, my peace for you. No, no, no. It's peace from God. We bless others with what God has already blessed us with. Recall that Jesus said in John 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Jesus says that to you. If you can read the Scripture today, Jesus says, my peace is for you. I give you my peace. I do not give as the world gives. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. The peace we have from Jesus Christ is not something from the world. It's not something from another human being. It's the peace of God. It's His anointing on all of us as His disciples. It's His peace. And when we go someplace, we bring His peace with us. And we can give His peace away. That's not like the world. The world doesn't do that. The world doesn't give like that. In fact, the enemy who is in the world, the devil brings unsettling. He brings anxiety. He brings worry and distrust and fear and angst. And if you have those emotions, you know something's not right. Something isn't the way it ought to be. You know that in your soul. But Jesus gives us peace and He says, bring first of all peace to those who open a door for us. That we might know, that they might know, that we give them something which is not of this world. The peace of God. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. And notice how Jesus says, give this peace without any strings. Without any strings. He doesn't say, hey, check their religious affiliation first. Make sure they're the same denomination as you. No, no, no. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, hey, check their theology against your statement of faith. Jesus doesn't say, hey, when you meet someone, go, oh, look at that. I, I'd like to bless you, but point six here on the state, I don't think you agree with point six of our statement of faith. No peace for you. He doesn't say that. He says, give them peace. He doesn't say, compare how they're living to the book of Romans. He doesn't say, compare how they think to the Nicene Creed. He says, bless them. Bless them first. First of all, bless them and bless them with His peace. 
This is such a simple idea, and yet it's so otherworldly for us because, you know, we live in this world, and in this world we're only used to getting something when we've earned it. Or when we've demonstrated a significant need for it. Or when we've made assurances that we're only going to use it wisely. Because we're used to strings being attached, conditions being attached to everything. Every kind of blessing that the world has comes with strings. Conditions. The world says, I'll give you this if and only if you first agree to do this. First. Strings. But Jesus says, no, no, no strings. First of all, bless. Bless without strings. Recently we learned that our federal and provincial governments have agreed to bless Volkswagen with $13 billion. But only if They first build a $7 billion battery plant and then create 3,000 jobs for 10 years. And aside from the highly questionable economics, we say, well, it's kind of reasonable because there's strings attached to it. We'd all be way more upset if the government said, here's $13 billion, do do whatever you want. We would lose our minds if they did that. But because there's strings attached to it, conditions, we say, oh, uh, okay, I guess. We can swallow it. That's how the world gives. Our society doesn't mind when the government doles out welfare and ODSP and things like that because it says first, recipients can only get that if they meet a series of conditions. They first have to prove that they're in great financial need. And our society says, well, in that case, it's okay because there's strings attached to those funds. We don't just want to bless people. We have to have conditions. We have to have strings Society says their blessing must have a string attached to it because that's how the world gives. The world says blessing without strings is unjustifiable. You can't do that. It doesn't make any sense. But Jesus says, no, give things away for free. Bless people. Bless them. Bless them without strings, without any string at all. Without any string at all, just bless them. And we struggle with that. God knows we struggle with that. His whole economy, you know, our economy is based on certain things, but God's economy is based on gift and sacrifice. Gift and sacrifice without strings. Without strings. Just as Randy said, Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. He died for us before we even existed. He did it without strings, without any kind of string. I do this for you so that you can have a relationship with the Father. And so Jesus says, well, I know they're going to struggle because there's no strings here, so bless people and bless them with what I give you first. Bless them with His peace. And we can do that, right? Because Jesus gave us His peace first. We can bless with His peace, yes? Yes? Yes, we can. Say it with me. Yes, we can. We can bless people with His peace because Jesus gives us His peace so that we can share it. Do you not remember the song we just sang? Freely, freely. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share His love as He told me to. He said, freely, freely you've received. Freely, freely give. First, bless. First and foremost, right out of the start, this moment the door is opened, bless. Bless without strings, and bless is more than a greeting. It isn't a salutation. It isn't a nod to someone as we pass them along the way. It's intentional, deliberate blessing with what God first gave us, something the whole world is looking for. Blessing someone with what the whole world, all of human society wants. Something of tremendous and intrinsic value. God's peace. You know, the whole world wants peace because peace has the air of the kingdom of God. It is the air of the kingdom of God. When you experience peace, it's like you're breathing in the kingdom. You say, oh, this is fantastic. I love it here. There's peace. You know, when I talk to the visitors who come to the Storehouse of Hope, they come because they say the whole city knows that there's lots of different places to get coffee and some fellowship and maybe a snack or some lunch. 
But if you come here, there's peace. Come here, there's peace. And it's glorious. It's wonderful. And everybody wants it. Reverend Dr. Ed Silvozo taught me that. Everyone wants what the kingdom of God is. You can go anywhere in the world. You can go to Yemen. You can go to South Sudan. You can go to Saudi Arabia. You can go to Mecca. And the whole world wants healing and abundance and life and blessing. You will scarcely find a single person who says, blessing, oh, I don't want blessing. No, only the, the, only the deranged say such things. Only the demonized say such things. But the whole world wants blessing. And it's true, friend. You will find many who say, well, I don't want the gospel. Oh no, you're coming in Christ's name. I, I don't want the God. They'll, they'll resist that. And many people will have very significant resistance to the idea of the church because of all the bad first impressions they've had over the course of their lives. And you will always find resistance to godly doctrine. But who will turn down blessing? No one will turn down blessing. Who will say no to peace? You can meet someone on the side of the road. You say, I would like to bless you with God's peace. Can I do that? And you will hardly find any. You say, you know what? No. No, you keep God's peace to yourself. You will find one or two for sure. There's always some. But the vast majority of folks will say, you know what? That'd be great. I'd love that. Please do that. Because the whole world wants peace. The whole world wants what the kingdom of God is. So we begin with blessing. You know, on Thursday mornings here at KC, we have a men's prayer group. We meet at 7 a.m. because some people have to go to work, and we want to respect that, so we're done by 8.30 so folks can get to work by 9. And after the pleasantries of small talk, we read a, we read a, a chapter from a helpful book, and then we discuss it, and then we spend some time praying for each other and praying for the ministry of Christ through Kingston Alliance. And right now, we're almost done. Michael Frost's helpful little book, called Surprise the World, The Five Habits of Highly Missional People. And in that little book, Michael Frost walks us through many, not all, but many of the concepts that we're covering here in our study in Luke chapter 10. And including this idea of starting with blessing. In fact, he calls that the first habit of missional people. The first habit, blessing. And Michael doesn't restrict himself to blessing with God's peace. He assumes that we can bless people in other ways too. He assumes that we can do acts of kindness, that we can have words of affirmation, perhaps some gift of some kind, even if it's a gift that doesn't have a financial cost. But in some way, you can build another up, encourage them, because God put them in your circle of influence for this reason. And Michael Frost talks about the value of that. I've ordered some extra books, extra copies, if you would like one. Speak to me, and I'll make sure you get one. On page 34, he, said, he tells us about a doctoral thesis. He calls it Blessers versus Converters. And it's a little story about re a researcher who sent two teams out of short-term missionaries to visit Thailand. And the first team had a, 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 a one strategy, and the second team had a different strategy. The first team had a strategy of just blessing people. Just come up to people and bless them in whatever practical way you can. Find something that will be of encouragement to them, a help to them, that will strengthen their arm, that will, that will build them up. Do something to bless them. And so that's all the first team was going to do. They, hadn't, they, they weren't even told to proclaim the gospel. Just bless people. And the second team went out just to, propose, to, to spread the gospel, just to tell people about Jesus Christ. And everyone they came up to, they said, I need you to know who Jesus Christ is. I would like to talk to you about Jesus. And they, they sent those two teams out. And, they, and what happened was that the research found is that the blessers had far greater social impact. And we expect that, of course, because when, social, when, when teams go out with the intention of contributing to the social good of their context, their social impact will be high. But the researcher found a second finding, something they weren't looking for in doing this experiment. And that's that the blessers, the ones who went out just to bless people, reached 50 times as many people for Christ as those who went out specifically to share the good news of Christ. This group reached 50 times more people. I want to quote this. The blessers were 50 times more successful at helping people find their way back to God. Unquote. Blessing 
leads to an open door. Prayer and giving ourselves to God's purpose leads to the first open door, the physical door, and that physical door opens the door to blessing. And that blessing opens an inner door. The inner door to someone to have unbiased fellowship with them. And we're going to look at that next week as we continue in Luke 10 here. But that fellowship establishes a level of trust. It allows people to share their heartfelt need with us. And when they share their heartfelt need, by God's grace and the providential anointing on us, we find a way to meet that need, address that need through the Holy Spirit, and then we find they're ready to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what Christ is telling us in Luke 10. Remember, He sent out His disciples to prepare the way for where He was purposing to go. He said, I'm going to go there, but before I get there, I'm sending you out to get things ready. He sends His Spirit ahead of us. He says, go. I'm sending you out as as lambs among wolves. Go, and when you enter a house, speak peace to this house. Begin with blessing. Begin with blessing. And you know, we who call ourselves Christ followers, for the most part, we get this completely backwards. We start with gospel proclamation. We say, no, the first thing we want to do is say, hey, here's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know the gospel of Jesus Christ? And we start with that. But people... It doesn't really work that way. I remember going to a class at Stony Creek Alliance as a fairly new Christian. I had just a few years under my belt of walking with Jesus, and I went to the class about doing about the best way to share, the, to do the work of reaching folks for Christ. And I was told the best way to reach folks for Christ is confront people with their need for forgiveness. To tell them about their need for forgiveness. Maybe you've been to that class. And it is, of course, true. I, I don't want to I undermine anything here. I want to understand it is true that God is holy, thrice holy, 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 holy is God most high. And it's true that we as sinners are most assuredly unholy. Absolutely. And of course it's true that as Hebrews 12, 14 says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Those things are true. These are undisputable facts. Without forgiveness for our sins, we remain apart from God forever. Absolutely. That's the gospel. Absolutely. One cannot find eternity, life in eternity, after death, apart from Jesus Christ. Apart from Christ, there's eternity in blackness and despair. But pointing out someone else's sin is not a good first step in sharing the good news. It's like having someone dump dirt all over your entryway the moment they walk in. It's just offensive. It gets your back up, as we say. It raises a barrier to the good news. You say you're here to share good news, but you're not good news. You're immediately bad news. And Jesus says, no, go and be good news. Go and bless first. You know, someone might walk up to me one day when I meet someone, I might say, hey, welcome to Kingston Alliance. And they might say, hey, Pastor Marcus, I see you're wearing glasses. Did you know that means there's something wrong with your eyes? It means your eyes are not so good. You're you're not as good as you could be. Your sight's defective. You can't see so well without glasses. I bet you wish you didn't have such bad eyesight, Pastor Marcus. Maybe if you didn't have such bad eyesight, you would notice that you need to lose a few pounds. Well, they'd be right in saying so. But friends, they're not going to remain my friends if they keep standing there pointing out my fault and limitation. That's not how you begin a friendship. And God says that's not how you go about reconciling His enemies to Himself. What does the Word say? Romans 2.4 God's kindness leads you to repentance. God's kindness leads you to repentance. Not your condemnation. The Word doesn't say your judgment leads others to repentance. No, it says His kindness leads people to repentance because God is kind and God is gracious and God blesses us so that we might know that we can begin a relationship with Him because He died for us while we were still sinners. Praise the Lord. Begin 
with blessing. And begin with blessing all the more so because you can literally not go wrong when you begin with blessing. Jesus said, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. And the principle Jesus is expounding here is not gender specific. And so the newer version of the NIV rightly says, if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. And if not, it will return to you. Friends, our resources can be wasted. We can spend all sorts of money, limited money and limited time and limited energy on doing things, but God's peace cannot be wasted. It comes from God, and it comes from God for His purpose. He gives it to us for His purposes, and therefore it's going to accomplish His purposes. It's like His Word. Remember Isaiah 55 where the Lord says, As the rain and snow come from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's how His word works and that's how His peace works. When we distribute the blessing of God's peace, we don't need to concern ourselves with the character of the person we're blessing. You don't need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about wasting God's resources. You might have just met them. You don't know them hardly at all. They might not be all they present themselves to be, you say. But nevertheless, bless them with God's peace because God's peace will only land where it can accomplish His purpose. If it can't accomplish His purpose, it will land back on you, and you'll be no worse for wear. Blessing can only rest where it's welcome. That's the good news. The bad news and the sad news in this is that not all blessing is welcome. Because even after the door is opened, Jesus says, if not, it will return to you. Friends, this is a sad truth, but some will open their door to us even though they're not people of peace. But they'll open the door to us for their own reasons. Perhaps to be seen as welcoming. Perhaps they, they want, hey, hey, my neighbors don't think I'm welcoming, but I'm going to show my neighbors. And so they welcome you in. But they're welcoming you in for selfish purposes. Some only pretend to be people of peace. That other, would applaud, that other people would applaud them. Some perhaps welcome you in for selfish reasons because they say, oh, this person's offering peace. I want peace here. I don't want peace to my neighbor's house. I don't want peace to the rest of my family, but I want peace. And so they welcome you in selfishly. But those people are like the rocky soil that the sower spreads seed on, and the seed sprouts quickly, but the plant cannot take root. And so the blessing cannot rest on them because they do not welcome it for God's purposes. They welcome it for selfish purposes. But friends, this is truth, that the blessing of God is for sharing. The blessing of God is is for sharing. And that's why Jesus warned, warned all of His disciples, don't hoard blessing. You can't hoard it. It's there for God's purposes, so don't even try to hoard it. He told us the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, so that we would know that the blessing of God comes with the responsibility of sharing it. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing. And we, when we who have God's peace have it, we are expected to share it. That's why He gave it to you. And if you have peace in your life, if you have peace with Christ, you have that peace so that you can share it. If we're faithful for a little, God will entrust us with much. If you have a little peace now, then share what you have. Because soon God will entrust you with much. Share it because it was given to you so that you might share it. Freely, freely you received. Freely, freely you give. You know, if you know your Bible, you know that after God's people had been freed from Egypt in Exodus, but before they got to the Promised Land, when they were still at Mount Sinai, when they were in that in-between time, before the dedication of the tabernacle in which God would travel with them into the Promised Land, the Lord spoke to Moses and said to him, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say this to them, the Lord bless you 
and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Number 6, 23-26. to 26. And we tend to stop there at the end of verse 26 when we read that blessing. We often read it in benediction as God's people prepare to leave God's house and go back out into the world. We tend to stop there. But in the very next verse, in verse 27, God tells Moses why it's so important to speak blessing over people. Now remember the context. This is before they go to the promised land. And God said, bless them with these words. And then he says, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Hear me now, friends. To bless another in God's name is a needed step. It's a needed step because it prepares the soil of their hearts prepares the soil of their hearts. If they can receive the peace of God, if they can breathe the air of God's kingdom, then God can bless bless them with more of Himself, more of His kingdom. And so we bless them so that God will bless them. We say, God has given me this peace. I give this peace to you so that God might bless you with Himself, with a relationship with Himself, that they might receive that greater blessing of a relationship with, with Jesus Christ, and so know God the Father. First, we start in prayer. First, we start by praying for more workers, because that prepares our own heart, so that our Father might add to our number who are doing the work, that He might multiply the number of folks who are going out to spread His name to the nations, and then we count the cost. We count the cost so that we can be fully prepared for the work, fully engaged in the work, fully willing to sacrifice of ourselves for the sake of His name in the work. Because if we're not prepared for the work, how can you prepare others for the work? And then when by God's command we go, when by God's providence we find ourselves in front of others, when by God's divine timing the door is opened, we begin the work with blessing. We bless to put His name on those we bless. That He should bless them with Himself. Because God always purposes to work through those who already know Him. Through those who already are part of His kingdom. Those who are already walking with Him. Those who by prayer and commitment have prepared themselves to partner in what He has gone ahead and how He's already working. Praise the Lord. So they will put My name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Friends, I want us to understand this group of messages called the work. This is not a group of messages to file away in a mental folder entitled, That Was Good. You walk out, you go, oh, that was good. And you file it away, and it doesn't make any difference. No, no, no. That's not the point here. The point is extraordinarily practical. It is for us to take these things and employ it. God is giving us this, this week in your life for a reason. Why didn't He give this to you two years ago? Why didn't He tell you this 18 years ago? No, He's giving it to you now. Why didn't He wait four more weeks? No, He's telling you now. Why? Because this week you need it. Because this week He wants you to bless someone. He wants you to pray for someone. He wants you to count the cost. He wants you to get engaged in what He's doing. So we'll pray for God to send out more workers. Pray to be for that He might use you in the work. Count the cost. Search yourself. Recommit yourself to the work. And then apply what you've just heard. And so to that very end, I want to give you a a concluding challenge. I want to challenge you the way Michael Frost challenged us in the men's prayer group. To bless three people this coming week. To bless three people this coming week. Bless someone you know. Perhaps a family member. Perhaps someone you've been praying for for a very long time. You say, well, I've blessed them and blessed them and blessed them. Bless them again. There's no harm in that. Bless someone you know well. Bless someone you hardly know, but you know their name. Perhaps a clerk at a checkout counter that you always seem to see at Loblaws. Perhaps someone at work that that crosses your circle once in a while. 
They work in another department. And you know them. You know their name. That's hardly, that's about all you know of them. Seek to bless them this week. And bless someone else. Someone that God is going to bring across your path this week that you do not even know yet. You do not yet know their name. But God is going to bring them into your circle of influence this week so that you can bless them. The first two, the family member and the other person you know by name, you can, you can pray for them by yourself. You already know their names. You can pray for them in your morning devotions tomorrow. But this last person, the person that God is going to bring in answer to prayer, well, we're going to pray for them right now as we close this message. Because I really think that God is purposing that we should bring something of Him to the world around us this week. Father, we thank You for this challenge. We thank You for the work that You are doing. The work that You've gone ahead of us to do. The work that You prepared in advance for us to do. The work that Your Holy Spirit is already doing. The work, Lord God, that You made us to be part of. We thank You, Lord God, that you, You've given us all this. This divine command to go. The divine providence that there's somewhere to go, the divine timing that You will open a door for us. So Father, we pray for an open door to bring Your blessing this week. We pray for an open door to bring Your blessing this week with someone we've long known, someone we barely know, and someone we, that You are going to put across our path this week. And it might be, Lord, it might be someone that we don't want to bless. Father, when we meet them, remind us by Your Spirit they are here that we can bless them. Let us give them your peace. Let us bless them with your peace that they might know that you are working, that you haven't forgotten them. You haven't set them aside. You did not make them that they should live and die in, in, without you in darkness their whole life. You've made them that they would know you. Father, let us bless them. Let us bless them with your peace. So Lord, as we close, I ask that You would put Your peace upon us. That You would fill us from the soles of our feet, from the underside of our toes, to the very top hair of our heads with Your peace. Fill us afresh with Your peace, Lord, that we would be out of the overflow of Your peace. Bless those around us with Your peace. Father, I ask Your blessing upon Kingston Alliance Church. I ask Your blessing upon all who hear this message. I ask Your blessing, Father, that we would share the blessing of Your peace with others. And to that end, we commit ourselves in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said,